super stoked to, it sounds like this is loud, someone's covering their ears, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, we're really happy to be here. Um, we have a really great program uh, today so far. We've had an amazing array of bike advocacy organizations, bike businesses. We've had um, amazing people from the state and the city. Uh, there's a tremendous energy around Bike Month, which is in May. Uh, there's a lot of things going on. We um, encourage everyone to go to baystatebikeweek.org and look at all the amazing activities that are, gonna, that are starting today. Um, so we're happy to be here organizing this event. Um, I'd like to um, thank Aeronaut Brewery, who is a silver level bicycle friendly business. With, I tell the story all the time, but the first beer ever sold uh, by Aeronaut was to the bike community uh, for a Boston bike party. Um, I want to thank the um, Somerville Bicycle Committee encouragement and education team for their work in helping to organize this event. And I want to point out one person in particular, Aira Shore. I don't know what Aira is, but Aira has been an, an amazing ball of energy. This event takes a lot of planning, and Aira has been incredible. So, um, so without further ado, I would like to um, introduce um, our colleague Larry, who is here from the Somerville Climate Forward um, group, and got that right, or probably not. Um, Somerville Climate Forward. Um, and uh, there was a fantastic sustainability tour that took place before this event. We're partnering with um, Larry and Lee and other people from Somerville Climate Forward to put on this panel. So, Larry? Thank you, Ken. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, my name's Larry Yu. As he said, I represent Indivisible Somerville on the Climate Coalition of Somerville. Um, and uh, we helped to put on the sustainability tour. Um, there's a core planning group with, consisting of Sam Musher, Lee Mounier, Paola Masoli, and Councillor Stephanie Hirsch. And so I just want to say a couple words on behalf of that planning committee. Um, I just want to say some thank yous first, and then ask one favor from all of you. Um, so first, the thank yous. Um, thank all of you for coming, and for coming on the sustainability tour, hopefully, as well. Thank you to the bicycle committee for allowing us to co-sponsor this event with them. And thank you to Aeronaut for hosting this event. Um, most of all, I want to thank the 20 um, residents and businesses throughout Somerville that opened up their homes to share their experiences uh, on their sustainability journeys. They deserve our credit. We couldn't do this without them. Um, this, this event is really about neighbors sharing their experiences with other neighbors. Um, so, uh, I, I'm hoping, and this is the favor that I'm going to ask of all of you, I'm hoping that all of you can share with one of your neighbors something that you learned about sustainability on the tour today. So can anyone, anyone, any takers? Are, are we got one, two? Come on, somebody? All right, well. Uh, <laughs> so, um, with that, I just want to hand over to Councillor Stephanie Hirsch. Thank you very much. I'm so happy to be here. Uh, right now I'm going to introduce the elected officials who are in the room with us. And I'll be back in a minute to uh, facilitate the panel, which should be a lot of fun. I'm going to leave Ayana, our, our headliner, for last. And I will start with our awesome State Senator, Pat Jalen, who lives right down the block. Where are you, Pat? Oh, <laughs> she was here. She's such a great advocate for all things that are good basically, including distracted driving and the vulnerable road users bill, which just passed uh, the Senate on Thursday. Uh, next up is Senator Will Brownsberger. Where are you? Right here in the uh, orange in the front. He cycles from Belmont to Boston daily, though he said he's sort of multimodal and sometimes runs the seven miles. And he was the author and advocate for the vulnerable road users bill. Thank you very much. Uh, among our city council, we have Mark Niedergang, who's the, the Ward 5 alderman. He had traffic and parking committee, and he has been an urban bicyclist for 40 years. And uh, over here, we have uh, JT Scott, who's the Ward 2 councilor. 
He's ridden his bike to two meetings already this morning and his four-year-old rode his bike to this event. And he's always working for traffic calming in the Union Square area. And uh, we have uh, Ward 3 uh, Councillor Ben Ewan Campen. He bicycles 10 miles to work every day. <laughs> Back and forth. <laughs> And he's been doing great work for traffic calming on Prospect Hill and in Ward 3 and Union Square. And our other counselors wanted to be here, but some of them couldn't for different reasons, including, including President Valentine, um, because it's uh, Greek Easter today. And I will say that as a counselor, I believe Matt McLaughlin, uh, I, and Katiana, none of us have cars, and many other people almost do. And the other people generally don't have access to cars. So you'll have a meeting that goes to like 1 a.m. and everybody's looking at each other like, can you give me a ride home? No. Can you give me a ride home? No. <laughs> uh, so finally, I'm really happy to, that Ayanna I Presley is here. We're so happy that you're here. I just want to share how, you want to give a round of applause? I want to share how I met Ayanna when uh, well, she came to my house and I had about 11 little girls sitting at my kitchen table and they were talking, blah, blah, blah. She came in, she was driven in and a kind of an old car, I must say, it wasn't super fancy. She didn't talk to me, she immediately sat down and talked to these little girls about what was on their mind. And it just captured my heart that she, that was who she wanted to hear from. And I just love people who defy categories, who can build bridges, talk passionately, think with tremendous brains and power, and I'm so excited that somebody like that is representing us. Um, so I'm gonna call her up, and just to know Mira Curitoni, who's another amazing person and advocate, is gonna be coming a little later, so we'll introduce him later. So. Thank you, everybody. thank you for your leadership. It's good to be in Somerville, good to be home, good to be in the district. Especially in Somerville, this might be ground zero for disruptors and activists and agitators, and so I definitely feel at home. Um, but I just want to say uh, thank you to the Somerville Bicycle Committee, the Climate Coalition of Somerville, Aeronaut Brewery for hosting us. And I am wearing uh, this pin today, but I want you to know that although I don't wear this pin every day, um, the work of the bicycling community and ensuring bicycle safety is the work that I carry in my heart and that I do every day. I am not new to this work. In my time on the Boston City Council, I convened some four hearings uh, on bicycle safety, pushing for a crash data report, and then worked with Martin Walsh, Martin J. Walsh, the mayor of Boston, to author the first side guard ordinance in the country that is now being replicated on the federal level. And I've always done this work in coalition with community and those most impacted by the issue. And I continue to do that, which is why I wanted to be here today. Because I do believe the people closest to the pain should be the closest to the power, driving and informing the policy making. Now, when I said that throughout the campaign, there are people in their very uh, shallow and lazy analysis who thought I was talking about me. I was not. I was and I continue to talk about the people that I'm actively listening to, that I intentionally engage. Because if you want to better understand the complexity and nuance of an issue, you need to be in proximity to it. And then not only will you better understand the complexity of the issue and what is the pain, but you will be able to develop the most innovative and enduring solutions for that. I am so proud now to have taken that coalition work and my heart for this community all the way to Washington, co-chairing the Congressional Bike Caucus along with Congressman Earl Blumenauer of Oregon. And we've just introduced legislation to restore the bicycle commuter tax. Of course, we are, of course, we continue to fight for federal investment in Vision Zero. And I want to just tell you, you know, why I, I care so much about this, this issue in this community, because I don't bike. Um, for those of you that don't know, uh, I have chronic knee problems. Right now, I'm up here with a torn MCL. I was sent to Washington to kick butt, took it seriously. Uh, tore my MCL. And so my limbs are compromised, but not my voice. And I'm gonna continue to raise mine alongside you on this issue. You know, as a voter, forget being an elected official, 
I hate when people try to, elected officials and lawmakers, uh, my tribe, which I love fiercely, but when they try to communicate to a constituency through a single issue, so they'll come to black folks and only talk about criminal justice reform. They go to the Latino community and only talk about immigration reform. They go to women and only talk about reproductive justice. They go to the LGBT community and they only talk about marriage equality or accommodations and support for the transgender community. But the reality is that we don't live in big checked boxes. We live in intersectionality. We live in nuance. And we have to legislate in this way. So although I don't ride, I am passionate about multimodal transit and demanding that we make that federal investment because we are struggling as a nation to coexist, to share space, even in the halls of Congress. And the manifestation of those struggles we see on our roadways every day. I care about this because this is the this is at the nucleus of the intersectionality of climate justice, of transit justice, of health justice. And might I also say, as someone who's dedicated my adult life to breaking cycles of violence in all forms, what is happening on this roadway is violence. So this is about fostering peace, building community, sharing the roadways. This is about climate justice, this is about transit justice. This is about improving public health outcomes as people burn calories instead of carbon. And so, so I just want to say thank you to this incredible coalition of advocates who push us to do more, who hold those of us in government accountable. I want to say thank you to my brother and sisters in arms uh, on the city level and the state level for what they do each and every day. And I am so very proud to be your congresswoman representing this district. And it is my hope that by being bold, by fighting every day to advance intersectional policy making that will get us at a more equitable and just world, that you will be just as proud to call me your representative. Thank you all for being here today. Oh, the mayor's here, where is he? Oh, I told you. <laughs> My goodness. Oh, oh, I beat you with a joke, okay. All right, well the mayor, the mayor and I go way, way back and I am so uh, delighted that we now have the opportunity to be partners in this new role, and, I, and you know, you are everywhere, and I find that we are always in a space that's either a protest, a march, a rally, yeah. and so you are modeling that thing which I think is so critical for the times we find ourselves, and that is activist leadership. And you have always been on the fore of those issues, recognizing the intersectionality of racial, social, and economic justice, and I appreciate you, and so without any further ado, the mayor. Thank you, Congressman. Now that's an act you don't want to follow. I, and I, literally, I apologize. I, I'm coming from Western Mass, and I have to go back out to my son's baseball tournament, and, and I pulled over the change on the side of the road and texted the congresswoman. And, uh, and I'm like, I gotta, be, I gotta get there before she speaks. <laughs> but anyway, uh, she spoke eloquently really about equity, and when she was on the city council, actually, when she was working for then Senator Kerry, uh, we got to be good comrades and colleagues and when she was in Boston City Council, we were working on issues of equity, not just within our communities, but around the region. She was championing really the cost of Boston, of who has access to liquor licenses and what that meant for small businesses and economic opportunity in some of the most underserved neighborhoods of Boston. And she led that charge. And we talked about you know, how mobility, transit equity, environmental justice, social and public health, how it is part of a complex ecosystem that is our communities. And she was the one voice in the city of Boston leading that child. And I, and I totally respect that. And, that. and she's obviously doing it at a national level for all of us. So for here in Somerville, I'm, I'm proud and privileged to be the mayor of a community that gets it. These values are part of our DNA. We're cerebral about it. We're leading the charge, uh, setting the standard on taking on climate change and, and transit equity. Uh, and it's really important because it is the most vulnerable populations who suffer the burden. We have several envi environmental justice zones in our city. Uh, we have more than 200,000 vehicles who come over I-93, uh, that interstate highway, which we didn't want a generation ago that they gave to us. 
Uh, but we have fought hard and for more than 40 years. And for all the advocates and activists, I want to say thank you. The Green Line is coming to Somerville because of your work. That's why the Green Line will take 25,000 motor vehicles off the road. What the Climate Coalition, the Bike Committee have done here is remarkable. We have started, we're not done, you know, we have dozens of miles of new bike share, uh, share roads and dedicated bike lanes, and we're going to invest millions to do more. Uh, that is going to happen. We have the first ever climate forward plan in Somerville. But it's not going to be about Somerville. It's going to be about the region and the standard we set. I don't know if you noticed, really does something happen at the state level, and pretty much nothing, notwithstanding your hard advocacy, happen at the national level. It's city states and city regions around the world that are setting the standard on taking on uh, climate change and taking on the cost for transit equity and for access to housing, authentic choice for housing for people and public health. And the regions that get that will be the regions that not only sustain, that thrive. So we need to be that standard for around the world. I'm privileged and honored to be here, especially with my uh, good friend, uh, the Congresswoman. Have a great, great day today. I want to thank, again, the Bike Committee and, and the Climate Coalition for all that you championed in Somerville. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. <laughs> Stephanie. Okay, so if our panel can come up. And while they're coming up, I'm just going to say who it is. We have uh, Vivian Ortiz. Come on up and sit on these chairs, guys. I'm going to have them all tell their own story of uh, how they ended up being car free and what they think of the world, but I'm just going to do a quick introduction. Uh, right here we have Vivian Ortiz, who's the coordinator of the Healthy Community Champions for Mattapan Food and Fitness. And she's been uh, a, bicy a bicyclist for five years. So not so long, but she took it by storm. Uh, Mark Chase, who's a trans transportation planner and adjunct professor at Tufts. We know him best, though, for his champion and um, ship and advocacy for neighbor ways. He also helped found Zipcar. Uh, Tegan. Tyke, right here, she's a transportation planner for Cambridge, and our very own Dan Bartner, who's a senior plan Bart Bartman, and who's a senior planner in Somerville, and has been working for many years on our zoning overhaul, which very much will affect parking policy as well as transportation policy. And I'm Stephanie Hirsch, I'm a city councilor. So I'm going to kick off this panel. Uh, we know that uh, mobility and transportation is all about our own personal stories as well as how our own lives interact with the infrastructure and the community. So I'd like to just start off by asking each of our panelists what's their own story of how they ended up car free and how has it shaped their, their lives and their worldview. So why don't we just go down the row if you want to start, Mark? So, um, some of you may know this about me, but I was involved early with Zipcar, and so it's hard. How many people have actually driven a Zipcar where you're paying the bill? So, you know what it's like to be on Zipcar time. You're always thinking, I have to get this car back, or wait, I have a half hour. Can I do something with that half hour so that I can actually get something done during that time? It makes it be very efficient, and so I owned a car while I got into Zipcar. It died and that was 17 years ago. And, and really, I don't consider myself car free, I consider myself car light, because we have things like Zipcar, Lyft, Uber, other options, and so I'm, I'm car light, and I think talking about getting to car minus one, whatever that is for you, is a good thing to talk about. Hey there, um, I'm Tegan, I, um, I have a bit of a history in the bike community as well. I um, was also on the Somerville Bike Committee a while back, also on the Cambridge Bike Committee, um, I now work for the city of Cambridge on very multimodal projects, um, but I did not start there. I, uh, I lived in a lot of places when I was young, but I turned 16 in North Carolina, where it was the norm and sort of the definition of freedom to get a vehicle and to be able to drive it to where you wanted to go. About three months after I got a car, I moved to Singapore, which is a city where if you want to expensive to own a car, and that is not how you have freedom in that city. <laughs> So, but I kept my car um, in North Carolina while I was there and I came to college here in Boston. And when I came here, I had the um, very, um, the lack of foresight to think that I should bring my vehicle here to Boston while I was in college and try to park it around and use it. And I very quickly learned that that was a terrible idea. It was incredibly expensive and it wasn't what defined my freedom here. And so from there I started biking 
and um, was a passionate, sort of almost primarily biker for a long time, but that's now changed into being a runner, a biker, a transit rider, and also a light car user. Um, I should mention that I sold my car when I graduated from college to be able to buy a ticket to go teach abroad in China, so that since then I have not owned my own. But similarly, I understand that I have access to other people's cars. My mom has a car that has my son's car seat in it, for example. And I use it sometimes. And so I don't think anyone should feel shamed um, for some use of a car, but the point is making every other choice as positive and available as possible for folks so that a car is more of a last resort. I'm Vivian Ortiz, and I live in Mattapan. Yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I grew up in El Paso, and I was thinking about this morning, 40 years ago, I got a driver's license. And El Paso, like all of Texas, we have more than enough roads, so I drove absolutely everywhere. Moved to New York City in 20, 2007. Of course, I didn't need a car. Then I moved to Boston in 2009, and people immediately told me, you, you need to get a car. It's not like New York, the train doesn't run 24 hours, you're just not gonna be able to live without a car. And I commuted for five and a half years to Wellesley, um, to my job on the green, where the red and the green line, and at least once a year, the facilities person would come up and tell me, I was the assistant to the president, don't you think it's time for you to get a car? So like, there's this expectation that because of my age group, the fact that I don't own a car, it's like, what's wrong with you and when is it that you're eventually going to get one? Um, I don't want a shovel, I don't want to pay $30 for parking, and these are some of the most aggressive drivers I have ever encountered in my life. <laughs> and for that reason, I don't, I don't own a car. Um, I do have to use a car because of my job. I'm the Safe Routes to School coordinator, and my region is not all of Boston, and every time I am having to return the zip car, I am getting really, really anxious because of having to be out there in a car with all of those folks that are also driving. So that mic was dead. Uh, so I'm Dan Bartman. I'm a senior planner with the city of Somerville. Uh, my wife and I live downtown near the, uh, the MGH train stop. Uh, we're from Pittsburgh originally. Any Pittsburghers in the house? <laughs> uh, so the neighborhoods there, the topography makes it really hard to, uh, to walk from one neighborhood to another. So you pretty much have to own a car in Pittsburgh. Um, but we moved to Boston actually after a two year stint for grad school in Phoenix, Arizona, which is where walkable urbanism went to die. <laughs> Uh, it's, it is very hot there. Um, but, uh, you know, with all due respect to the people there that are working really hard to, to reestablish walkable urbanism in Phoenix, um, after moving here, uh, we actually kept our car, um, although we, we were living in the Coolidge Corner neighborhood in Brookline and, uh, and quickly learned that we didn't need to use it on a daily basis, but kept it around so that we could drive to Market Basket and save <laughs> money on groceries. But it only actually took a couple times of doing that to realize that we were paying more for the parking space than we were saving m monthly on our grocery bill. Um, so my, my, it happened to be that my sister uh, got a teaching job in Southern Florida and needed a car immediately. So we sold our car and never looked back since then. Uh, we've been monthly supporters of the MBTA ever since. <laughs> having to try to chase after the bus on his way home to West <laughs> uh, Thank you for the introductions. The, and just to go back to the topic of this panel, um, you all, this, the, this is the bicycle month kickoff, the bike month kickoff. And not everybody who's a bike enthusiast is car free, and not everybody who's car free is a bike enthusiast. But it's an important question, I think, to think about how we as households, how we as a community, how we as a nation can create more options for people that are less car dependent. Uh, because it really should, I hope, help everybody, whether you need more bike lanes, whether you want to drive and you want to not be jammed up in traffic, or whether you walk. Um, so that's what we're talking about in this um, panel. And as we had this wonderful um, introduction but for, from Ayana saying it really should be about building peace and about building community. And so sometimes it doesn't feel like that in terms of reducing car dependence. But that's what we're gonna talk about today is how much can we reduce car dependence in our communities without starting a war, ideally, <laughs> among our residents that we care about. 
Um, before we go on to the next question, I'm just going to show you a few slides if you can look up at these. Um, uh, just go back one. Um, this little dog is named Indiana. It's owned by Devin and Jesse Moose who live in East Somerville. They don't have a car and they love to go on adventures, including on the T, the buses and the, and the subway with Indy and he also loves it. Isn't that cute? <laughs> so go on to the next slide, please. This is, a sh this is data from the census that tells us how many communities in Somerville do not have uh, how many households in Somerville don't have access to a car, and it was surprisingly high. It's 24 percent of all households do not have access to a vehicle. So it's actually not that um, it's not actually that rare, and that those people who don't have access to a vehicle are across all different income spectrums. I believe you know there are people who don't have the uh, money to buy a car. There's I have some constituents who are blind. They've never driven. They've been blind since birth. There's people who do it by choice. If you go on to the next slide, these are the main ways that people gave up their car, which were mentioned by our panelists. Some people have been car free their entire life, not just because they're blind, but one person moved in this first quote, she moved to Somerville after college. She never owned a car or had a desire for one. She, it just became a, a way of life. It's been like that for 40 years. Many, many people gave up their car because they had a reason. They had an excuse to try going car free, and that's my story as well. They, one person had their car stolen, they said, what the heck, let me try it. One person's car was 13 years old, it stopped working, they said, let's give it a whirl. And then some others had this kind of like final straw moment where like, I just can't take, with Vivian, I think, <laughs> I just can't take it anymore. This, this wonderful so quote, I realized that the cumulative effect of driving was to make me feel worse and worse. Over time that I thought that driving was exposing me to the worst in people and making me a worse person because of it. <laughs> and then there's some wonderful benefits of being car free that once people have a chance to do it, they find that it really grows on them. And then they want to get to the point where they're like, I'm never going back. You shop more locally, you meet people. I just put two pictures of, I'm always taking pictures when I'm walking around, which I'm doing all the time. People, some people love the, the flexibility of it. They can just leave their, walk out their house, know that they're gonna get someplace by bus and come back by subway or come back even by lift or by scooter or whatever. And I love this quote, which was from Sarah Davila, who's a high level administrator in the schools. She said, I love the processing and transitioning. I do walking from place to place. When I'm walking, I think, I do writing in my head, and I leave the last thing behind and look forward to the new thing. <laughs> um, uh, so let's, there, there are some challenges as well. People want to go to the suburbs. They need to carry heavy things. They have to drop off their child at child care, which is far away. Um, some of the, har the hardest ones to read is that the tea doesn't run in the middle of the night. It's not reliable and it's very expensive. If you go on to the next. Um, this quote just kind of breaks my heart. It's from an Uber driver. And this person said, I started dri driving Uber. I picked up, I'm picking up people in Back Bay at 3 a.m. after a 12 hour shift, shift to be dropped as far as Lynn. Cookers, dishwashers, construction workers, etc. They're all forced to spend about 14 to $25 every night to get back home, which we know is like at least an hour or two of, of the work that they just completed. Um, so let's go ahead and ask the next question, and I'm especially focusing in this question on Tegan and Mark. So what are some small or big ways that using the tools that you have as traffic engineers, data experts, technology whizzes, what are some big changes that we can make to address the problems that people are having? All right, I guess, I guess I'll start. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, I'm a planner. Um, I work in transportation practically 24 seven because when you have a job like that, it, it's not just your job, it's your, it's your life. You travel to get around as well. And I think I have never heard anyone say it as well as the Congresswoman just said, where people do not operate in sort of like one mode and yet a lot of planning and engineering tends to be sort of siloed in a single mode. We're talking about a bike facility somewhere. We're talking about a plan that the MBTA is doing to change or improve bus service. It's very hard for us to all think about all of these things together to create basically a set of options that are very attractive for people because I don't know about you, but while once upon a time I used to bike to work every single day, now my decision really depends on the day. It depends on my child. It depends on how I feel. 
And so I think that while, um, as a credit to the work that I think the bike advocacy community and others that I work with have done, I no longer at the city of Cambridge have to be sort of the, the bike cheerleader and the bike advocate. It's something I used to do and I find there's almost no need anymore. That consideration is brought into every project. What I end up being a cheerleader for in every one of our projects is are we thinking about all of these modes together? Are we thinking about how to make it the easiest for people to bike, to take transit, and to walk? And are we designing something at that scale that makes it a community that people will choose those things over driving anytime they have an opportunity to do so? And if they still choose to drive, let's respect that and think that not everybody operates as well in sort of an, a world of idealism or um, extremes where, no, I'm going to choose to go car free because I know it's better for the planet, better for the community. Um, a lot of people are in their everyday lives and would love just the convenience or the ease of getting home quickly, simply, and without using effort. And so we try to focus on bringing that all together in our conversation. And I realize it's a very high kind of planning level conversation. I can easily give specifics. Yeah, why don't you give us a few specifics? Okay, so I'll give you I'll give you one specific. Um, so as an example, um, I worked hard with quite a few people around me to implement the first bus lanes in Cambridge. Um, some people who worked on that are actually in the room here, and um, they're dedicated space for buses on a commuting corridor that carries at one point in the corridor more people on buses than on any other mode in that on that street. And so we knew that if we could take away a bit of that capacity for the buses, we would be getting a ton of people to work more reliably, more comfortably, faster. So we engaged in this conversation with folks, but it wasn't just a bus lane. It was also we were able to improve the cycling facilities in one of the directions. In the other direction, we combined the bus and bike facilities, which we consider to be far from ideal, but we didn't have the kind of investment that's needed to create a Western Ave type separated bicycle facility with all of the wonderful landscaping. So we made some compromises. We talked to the MBTA a lot. We talked about training drivers, making sure people could feel as comfortable and safe in those facilities as possible. And we worked really hard with drivers and looking at traffic and the way traffic worked to understand how can we do this without having a disproportionate effect on how people who do drive to the star market to do their groceries so they feel like they can't get there anymore. And what we're finding, um, we haven't done our sort of public forum to sort of talk about the results, is that we think that that's exactly what happened. There's this inordinate benefit towards transit riders. It's huge and it's very um, quantifiable and it makes me so excited to be able to share that with people in a month or so. Um, it also does not appear to have really slowed down people who drive. It looks and feels different, so some people think that it's taking longer, but it's really not. It just looks and feels different and it changes that culture to take away that feeling of priority for the vehicles and share it more with all the people on the roadway. And our surveys of cyclists using the facility almost unanimously say that it's significantly more comfortable than it was before. Is it the top ideal? No, but it is significantly more comfortable. So we just keep on working to making it the best we can for those modes. Is that a good example? Yes. Okay. Make me pass it to Mark. And... Um, hi everyone. I teach at Tufts, so I have a few students in the audience and I apologize because they've heard this too many times. But um, if you think about our, our car networks, they're, they're made up of cars and the roads and parking spaces. And like the Lord of the Rings, where one ring controls them all, if you had power over cars in any huge way, you would impact parking and congestion. And if you had travel control over the roads, that's a ring where you would have control over cars and parking. And if you control parking, you can also control congestion and the amount of cars that people own. And we only have control of parking in Somerville. We really don't have that much control to do something crazy like congestion pricing. We, we can't raise taxes on cars that would make people perhaps think twice about buying them. But I think we can do drivers a favor by um, making our parking policies both driver friendly, but not encouraging people to store cars long term on the street when they don't need to. How would you do that? <laughs> It's a discussion that is, we're about to undertake in Somerville, I think. Um, there's a number of counselors and the mayor who, who've said we need to have this discussion. But really it comes down to either slowly increasing the price of parking over a number of years so that um, people start to think about parking as a cost. And Somerville, I believe, is at $40 a year right now. So if you divide that by 12 months, that's roughly $3.50 a month. $3.33 a month to park. Um, <laughs> When, whenever we go to try and remove some parking spaces for bike lanes, it's, it's a matter of life and death for some people in terms of the way they react. And then we need to think, well, we're charging $3.33 for something that 
for you is extremely important, and I think that's a disservice to people who park, because um, one of my neighbors has a Saab, or had a Saab, that he kept on street for a couple of years and only drove like twice a year. So uh, the, the motivation for him to, to not park that car is nothing at $40 a year. You can't get cheaper stores than that. So I think that's one way of looking at it. The other, without impacting price, is just to not issue more permits than we have parking spaces. And that's another discussion, which is um, another way we could tackle that. So just um, head, heading over to Dan here. Um, so if it seems like a best practice is to cons constrict parking and to create dedicated bus lanes and dedicated bike lanes, is that something that as a city pl planner, is that, could you make that happen? Or how, how would you bake in some of these best practices into law? <laughs> well, so I mentioned earlier that I write the city's zoning ordinance and we've been working to uh, adopt a whole brand new from the ground up um, ordinance for since I got here in 2012. Um, we're very close. Uh, it might might happen this year, we hope. Um, and actually, there's a, a, a hearing or a, or a meeting on parking on Tuesday evening at six o'clock for anybody that would like to come uh, and, and listen in. Um, but uh, the main thing is is that all of our regulations currently subsidize automobile ownership and use, and that would that would be the main thing to get rid of. Um, the, the target in zoning uh, is probably minimum parking requirements. Um, uh, I don't know how much this is news to everyone in the room, but planners have no idea how much parking you need on your lot before you live there, <laughs> right? And that's what minimum parking requirements try to predict. Um, the science behind minimum parking requirements is recorded in suburban locations, and the front page of the book called Parking Generation that the Institute of Transportation Engineers publishes has a warning on that page that this should not be used in urban areas. And yet that's what, for decades, <laughs> we've used to determine how much parking all of our development should have. It's really a case-by-case -case basis, right? And, and you know, we've, we've proposed um, some areas of Somerville to still have minimum parking requirements. Is that where I believe we need to be? No. Um, the reason is that laws reflect culture change, right? We have to change as a culture for our laws to be accepted and adopted in the first place. Just because we come up with a, a, an idea for a law doesn't mean the culture is ready to accept it. And when a law actually takes place and is effective is because the culture went around, uh, right along with it. Um, so I think, I think that's the one thing we need to get past, the idea that minimum parking requirements are gonna solve our parking problems. They actually induce traffic and congestion on our streets. They reduce safety, they create environmental pollution, um, because they encourage automobile use. And that, that would be the first thing that I would say would be the, a major thing to tackle in, in zoning anyway, so, of like four or five. So just to reiterate, Dan is able to write into law the, the values that the community has and the requests, I mean, with some constraints, but the requests that the elected officials in the community ask for. So how do we change what the community wants? And I'm just gonna go to Vivian, who's been really working very hard um, in her own community on this topic and, and my, what, so what do you think? I'm laughing because at one of the last um, neighborhood association meetings, my neighborhood association meeting, there were developers there and my neighbors were like making them absolutely tell them how many parking spaces were going to be in that development. And it was like, they didn't get it. It was like, he said, we can accommodate in that space 12 cars. They won't be comfortable, but that's what, so. That's, that's very, very real for me. Um, our neighbors are, my neighbors, look at me as, uh, you know, I'm, I'm crazy. Why are you riding a bicycle? Why is it, why would you do that? And even encouraging folks to get back on the tee is something that's very, very difficult. So I have just personally decided I'm going to work like individual by individual as opposed to trying to go to a meeting and being the only person in the room um, that, that rides a bike, with the exception of my friend Lee Toma, who's somewhere back there from Milton, right? So we're like the only people that are any of these meetings that are actually riding bicycles. So just inviting folks slowly to come out or even inviting them to come out for a walk, just to be able to see what it's like and the benefits of walking or biking and what you're able to see and the less stress that you have in your life, when you're driving, it's like, don't give up the car. I know that's not possible, but let's just once in a while, if you might think of coming out. Um, and 
trying to do some education on what traffic calming measures are. And when the city comes to our neighborhood, it's usually seen as, oh, oh, it's gentrification and they're coming in to make a change as opposed to making an improvement. And trying to get the car drivers that live near me to understand that any improvement on the street is an improvement for everyone. Um, we recently were working on Mass Ave, Mass Ave between Melnia Cass and Columbia Road. If anybody has ridden a bicycle or walked on the sidewalk there, it is absolutely terrifying. So going and speaking to those communities about making a change, I have to go into that meeting knowing who the audience is, if they're all car drivers, explaining to them how having a protected bike lane makes it much more safe for them because then the cyclist has a place where he or she should be biking, the pedestrian feels safe on the sidewalk, and the person that's driving, if we've got mark lanes and everything. So it's having to kind of sell folks on why these things are beneficial. I don't get into the whole development thing, but it's just astounding that folks tend to dedicate so much more time to the parking than the actual living space. And I don't, I don't get that, so. Uh, so can you just go ahead with the slides? I'm just gonna go for a few, through a few more of these data slides if you go ahead. Um, in terms of people be, be, being able to become car free, there have been some game changers like bus tracking applications, zip car, dynamic maps, the bi bicycle infrastructure, deli more deliveries, car sharing service, and mobile technology, if you keep going. Um, and also, people have homegrown solutions. This is my family here. This is after they did Thanksgiving shopping, they used their old stroller. <laughs> and is Lena Webb here somewhere? Okay, well, that's her wine bottle that she put into her. <laughs> her, her, her grocery. <laughs> it's not open. It <laughs> and just if you can go on to the next one. This to me is like, this really is the heart of the matter and I find it really honestly heartbreaking. When you think about this, how do we have a shared vision that's inclusive? Are we talking about a war? Are we talking about coming up with a united uh, vision? Can we find something that helps everybody? So for those of you who have been following the Powderhouse Boulevard um, debate right now, there, is a, 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 there was a pedestrian death, which was terrible. And then there is a call for, and there have been years and years, a request for um, better pedestrian and bicycle safety, and lo and behold, of course, there was a fatality. And now there's a proposal to eliminate parking on one side of the street. And, um, you know, so some people say, like, well, why don't you, uh, Doherty's is the last, I think, big funeral home in Somerville, which is just has hundreds of thousands of memories for people. And one person said, well, maybe you should just move Doherty. Um, they say they use that as a parking overflow um, and then other people saying this is getting ridiculous nothing I remember is left about the community generation X just wants us to take with the funeral home for a bike lane They're, we can't afford to live here it doesn't belong to us we, nobody wants us in the community they're waiting for us to die um, and then you see even on the advocate side people being really not kind at all this person um, you're basically living up to your expectations of being being towny trash you know, go ahead and mow down some bicyclists, like you'll be happy about that. So when you think about our community, and we are a close community, you literally can hear what people, your neighbors are talking about, and you know what they're cooking for dinner because you can smell it coming through the window. Like, how do we get on the same page? And is that okay that we're behaving like this? And, but then how do you get to this common vision? You know, like, I, as an elected official, as a community member, it's really hard to figure out, and I, and I would love to hear from all of you, what, well, how do we get there? Like, is there a way to make a Stop case? Stop being gentrified. <laughs> right, so there's like this economic That's aspect of it. It's not just the bicycle, it's, it's also a lot of other stuff. So I'd love to hear from you. I'd like to just add that in my neighborhood, we have a very large home ownership rate in Manapan. So um, when there was a meeting about uh, redesign on a street, and there were lots of people there, and they don't want bike lanes, and it reminds me of what you said about the funeral home, because there's a funeral home on this side and there's a funeral home on there, and you're gonna have bike lanes where are we supposed to park? And that bike lanes mean gentrification, right? And I, I can see some of that, but 
don't they want their grandkids to be able to get around? I was planning a bike ride during the summer with some, with some young folks, and I couldn't take them on any of the major roads because they were terrifying. So here we got bike infrastructure. I mean, we got the, the, the bike share after folks for years and years and years saying, why don't we have it, why don't we have it, why don't we have it? We have it, we're not using it because it's not safe to ride, but we don't want bike lanes. So again, it's, I think, for me at least, it's going to smaller groups of people and explaining why it is that we're needing to, to calm the traffic. It's not just for us, it's for everybody because we need to slow down cars and then some of the things that we can do and how it would be beneficial for the entire community, not just me, the person that rides a bicycle. Um, I wanted to add to this because as a professional planner who facilitates public meetings all the time and hears things like this, and it doesn't matter how many times I hear it, every time I see a new example of it, it absolutely breaks my heart. Yeah. Um, and I would just like to say that I think that every single one of us in this room has either a personal or a professional or both responsibility to stand up to statements like this, no matter what the genesis of them is, even if you agree with the sort of thing that the person is fighting for. When I hear things like this, said in public meetings, I say to people, that's not acceptable. Just like it's not okay to generalize about a person about, for example, race or gender or something else like that. It's not okay to generalize about one specific kind of behavior that you see someone do and generalize from that into what type of person they are. And that applies to all sides. So there's, there's one aspect on that that I wanted to comment on, that it is all of our responsibility to play a part in combating this kind of talk on all sides, period. Um, on a sort of more higher level, you know, kind of um, working for the city and how do we sort of strategize and how we get to common goals kind of thing, the sort of the, the nice fuzzy warm like higher level stuff. Um, one of the things that we try to do at the city is we actually are, um, we're great enough to have a bunch of people who organize around cycling, we have a bike committee, we have a pedestrian committee, and we have a public transit committee, for example. So you have all of these citizens that are interested in all these different issues, but they do still often continue to think about them in those silos. And so we encourage the people who are all, we think, kind of fighting the good fight of saving our communities, saving our environment, um, creating more pedestrian-friendly scaled environments, and try to get them together on a regular basis to talk about what the commonalities are and what they're doing. Because it's still, I can't tell you how many times I hear somebody who's a transit advocate say, oh, but those cyclists, or a cyclist say, oh, but those buses are in my way. And this is completely unproductive. We should not be fighting each other. Our end goal is actually the same thing. Um, we just kind of carry it out in slightly different ways. So encouraging people with those kinds of goals to get together and hear those commonalities and figure out, oh, we are all, all act talking about reallocating space that is for long-term vehicle storage to much better uses. And sometimes that might be my really specific use that I want, and sometimes it might be something a little bit different, and that's okay, because it's all trying to accomplish the same kind of culture shift. So that's something we try to support. Mark, I know you've, you've thought a lot about this. Um, yeah, a, kind of a, a tale of two bike lanes of sorts. I don't know how many people know the Webster Avenue story, but um, it was interesting because we had about a year of neighbors meeting neighbors in living rooms and talking about removing parking for traffic calming, bicycle lanes, better crosswalks on Webster, and this involved removing parking on both sides of the street. Um, to Webster's credit, or to Webster's resources, they have a parking garage, but I don't think that actually is the point. The point was that neighbors were talking to neighbors and it was what I would call like an inside advocacy job, if you will. Um, we hope to do something like that on Powderhouse as well, of neighbors talking to neighbors, but the time frame is much shorter, where it took us a, a year to talk to people on Webster and get comfortable, and we had a public meeting where all the people who hated the idea didn't show up, and not because they felt like they wouldn't have a voice, but because they had had their voice with their neighbors and they felt like they had come to peace with the idea of what the decision was. So I do think the long game is part of that, but I do think talking to your neighbors is really big, and there's the stereotypes when parking is being removed, and then there's also just you're living on your street talking to people around you about what it's like to bike in the city, the things that are tough, the things that are easy, and things that could make your life easier so that they're more supportive of you when we get into these really difficult situations. I do want to say one thing, though, that 
if we managed parking really well and there wasn't a scarcity mentality, and we would say, if we could remove this parking, we're gonna have to make some changes, but we've been able to manage parking, so you've always had parking, and you're still always gonna have parking, but it might cost a little bit more, or we may not issue as many permits on your street. We're gonna be able to handle it. There is no confidence of that right now because almost no cities in the United States manage parking well, and I'm, I'm hoping Somerville will be the first one and a beacon in that department, but that does make these battles easier. I don't, I don't know if I have a whole lot to add to that, but one of the things we've been working on as a companion policy to go along with the proposed zoning, new zoning ordinance is actually looking into restricting access to on-street parking permits for, for new development that is within walking distance to our new train stations, new and existing train stations. The, our current on-street parking policies uh, were invented to solve a different problem than we have today. They came about in the early 80s when parking was a free-for-all. It was free on the streets in Somerville to park anywhere on the street for anyone that lived in Arlington or Medford or Melrose. And that's why parking permits came into play. We first uh, required um, on-street permits for places around Davis Square and Sullivan Square um, uh, in East Somerville uh, to control the people that were coming into the city and parking their cars to commute into Boston. Um, eventually it went citywide, but it was, it was instituted to solve a different problem. It, it essentially was free, um, $3.33 a month ends up being about 11 cents a day. Um, so think about how much any of you might pay for off-street parking at your apartment building, uh, for instance, and compare that to uh, what it costs to park on the street in Somerville, and you'll understand the imbalance. The other thing is that we give away almost unlimited permits. If you have an, a registered car in Somerville, you can get a parking permit, um, and it's an unlimited amount per household. So we made it practically free, and then we give away an unlimited amount that doesn't represent capacity. We induced our own parking problems that we have today, and we need a new parking policy to deal with the current si the, the situation that we have today instead of the situation from 1982. Have, um, one is that this is my own opinion, but on this top quote here is from a friend of mine who might even be here, but um, he's a, just this avid bicyclist, and he said, "My car is not necessary for convenient driving. Outside, my, my car is necessary for convenient driving outside the city for things or difficult errands like traveling to nature or, or whatever." And so you kind of wonder when you think about the 80,000 people who live in the city. Probably, you know, 50,000 50, of them, like at least half. Are, um, are, are in, in concept, they support less car dependence. So in a way, it's, it's a shame, you know, like, can we convert, can, can we encourage those people, can we give, encourage those people to drive less and not worry about the people for whom a car is really culturally and personally really important. And if you just go to the next slide, this was sort of an aha, aha moment for me. If you've ever seen this chart, it tells you like how you can reduce your carbon footprint. And the biggest, that big, big bar is for like having one additional child. <laughs> so I have three children. <laughs> so basically, we don't have a car, but you know what? I should never brag about that because I have three children. You know, so like, and meanwhile, you know, there are people who are longtime, you know, Somerville residents or whatever, they probably have a car or two, but they never have visited, they've never flown outside the country. So if you look at this chart up close, you know, it would be like um, they have less of an impact because they don't have this international flying. And you can't really, you know, it'd be pretty terrible if like I came up with a uh, uh, law as a city councilor to say you can no longer fly overseas. Or, you, know, <laughs> you know, so basically, like, how do we reframe it so that people understand that um, changes to our infrastructure and changes to our laws help people and they make sense in terms of what really matters to them. And to the, the point of the person who spoke over here, it, you know, less cars, fewer, less parking could mean more affordable housing or more open space or a better quality of life. Or if you have a car, you can get where you're going faster. So how do we reframe the conversation so it's more inclusive and recognizes that people are really different and they come from different places and they have different needs and that's okay. And our, you know, can our laws and our conversation be nuanced enough that that you know we can serve everybody's needs and like Ayanna said, build you know build peace and and build community in that.
I've been thinking about that a lot lately. I don't know the answer. Um, any, any thoughts or reflections? I think, I, first of all, I want to commend Somerville on the fact that so many of you elected officials are car light or do not use a car. I can not say that, unfortunately, for what happens in Boston. Um, and I just was going to think, it would be wonderful to have some of our elected officials act as role models. We have a transit-oriented development that is getting built in Mattapan Station. And about four weeks ago, the governor and the mayor came to have the ceremony to announce the fact that the funding had come in. I'd never seen that many cars in that parking lot. The, every single space was full. And then the following day, I noticed that they had repainted the lines. But they had two MBTA buses there. And I asked the general manager of the MBTA, I said, why are these buses here? Why didn't you guys actually come on these buses? This is a transit-oriented development. You're coming here to give money to add some bike infrastructure and other changes, and you all came in your individual cars. And he said, well, you know, I, I, said, I, I understand that, but, but you all need to be modeling that behavior. You're expecting us to do that, but then in turn, you're not. So having those kind of conversations, and also talking to them about that when you come into our neighborhoods, or any neighborhood, you need to talk to the folks that are using it because they usually will talk to folks that are not involved or at some point had go to the platform at Mattapan Station and talk to the people that are using the services. And that is something that does not happen. Um, the MBTA is doing a better job now. Um, for a long time, I've always asked why it is that they don't have information in multiple languages. Why is it that they're not putting the information that is accessible for everyone to see? And just recently, I've noticed that they are starting to make some changes, um, adding things and announcements that are in Spanish. It's taken a very, very long time. So having those conversations and getting folks that are not usually the ones that are invited or included in the conversation is extremely important. Because I spoke to people on the trolley in those days when these meetings that they were having all over, they had no clue that these meetings were taking place. And they were the ones that needed to be invited. So. Thank you to those youth that Somerville that are doing such a wonderful job. I just thought we have about um, seven minutes left, and I, w I just wanted to, to know if any of you have a suggestion, a question, a comment. Um, if you want to, um, I think you got to come up to the um, the microphone here. Why don't we have you and then you, and just come on up here. You can feel free to comment or whatever you'd like. Cool. Hey everyone. Turn this way. Um, one suggestion of something that we can all do to put more pressure on Boston, specifically on Mayor Walsh, is by attending the BCU's Glacial Pace of Progress ride next Sunday. It's going to be awesome. Um, so it's actually a tour of streets that Mayor Walsh and the city of Boston has promised to fix. Um, I think it's 10 different stops. And the whole uh, ride is polar themed, so dress, there are going to be penguins. All the things, um, and the whole the whole uh, message is that this is taking too long in Boston, way too long. Um, and so, please come to the ride, show up. It's a protest. Um, there's more information at the BCU table. <laughs> Thank you. So yeah, two part question. Just introduce yourself too. Oh, hi, I'm Tom. Um, I live in Cambridge. Um, I ride a bike every once in a while. Uh, I used to be on the bike committee. Not that that matters anymore, because that was probably a decade ago. Well, my, 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 my thing about this is, is uh, you guys were, I'm, I'm curious about, A, you said if we take away parking, that that will lead to more affordable housing. I'd like to know like what the thought behind that and statistics, statistics are. And then secondly, since we have Cambridge and Somerville people here, can we talk about Webster Ave and about that whole thing just in general? <laughs> Uh, I don't remember the exact the name of the study, but there was a, a, a study, I believe, from the Victoria Trans, uh, Transport Policy Institute uh, that researched uh, multi-unit buildings, essentially apartment buildings, from hundreds of locations and surveyed uh, whether or not the um, tenants were allowed to make a choice about whether or not they would rent parking on a monthly basis or whether or not they were given a parking space just rolled right into their rent. Uh, and the results of that research was that um, the residents that had a choice to pay for parking, on average, paid about $220 a month. 
um, and that um, the residents that did not, that uh, their rent was actually higher by $300 a month on average because the landlords were able to hide that number in their rent. Um, so just making it a choice is one of, one of the ways to reduce the, the cost of housing. Um, also, parking comes with a high price tag to build. Um, when minimum parking requirements try to predict for, through soothsaying or something um, to, to dictate how much uh, parking a development needs, um, all of that cost gets roped into the cost of development and passed down to the end user eventually. Um, instead of allowing um, that unique location under its own unique cir circumstances to determine its own fate, uh, and that's another way to reduce the cost, allow them to decide how much parking they need instead of trying to predict it beforehand. There's one other piece I've done some work with architects and developers around um, trying to get parking reductions. Usually it impacts what you can build on the lot. The circulation of the parking and where the parking goes could be built on and that gets you a lot more space for, for housing that you can then, you know, it creates more housing essentially on the same lot. But most architects come in and look at the parking standards, solve that problem, and then build around it instead of doing the optimal building. Um, Sebastian Mariscal, who I don't think is in the room, is an amazing developer who's always trying to look at the lot first and the parking last, and it's, it's really a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, Tom's other question was very specific. Uh, I am not, Tom, I am not working on Webster so I cannot give you a very specific answer, but I think there's a very important comment to make about this, which is that most of us do not operate on understanding where municipal boundaries lie and who you have to work with to get what done on this number of feet side of that line and this number of feet on the other side of the line. And so um, again, as a professional, it is very much our responsibility to recognize that even though we work within, you know, for us, Webster Ave ends at the city line and we have to come up with our plan for what we're doing there and then implement it. It doesn't work like that for people's lives. And so um, we work really hard on coordinating. I would say since I've been at the city just five or so years at Cambridge, I think the Somerville um, coordination has really been improving and increasing, and part of that is really having the capacity to really take the time to sit down together and talk about these initiatives. You know, we've coordinated on projects as major as, um, as the Green Line extension, and as sort of um, small as the sort of the, where Forest Street and Medford Street come together again at the city line, just at the sort of the north side of the Grand Junction line. And Somerville is talking about putting in um, protected bike facilities with buffers and sort of uh, flex posts. And Cambridge is talking about widening a sidewalk and making a multi-use path type future connection along that. And those don't match up right. And so we really have to figure out ourselves. And it really helps when we hear from other people to push us and say, you guys are missing the boat here. You know, one city's talking about this, you're talking about this, what is wrong with you guys? I mean, I'm always happy to hear that. And as staff, um, it, it's tough because sometimes it is really dependent on the relationships, and so it is on us to really build those relationships and make sure we have those good conversations. So I'm sorry I can't answer you directly about Webster, but I do think the point you're raising is an incredibly important one. Um, and having used, I used to write Webster all the time, and, it, and it's it's really uncomfortable. And I agree that some changes are needed. So. Our question for Matt for right. <laughs> I gave you a nice general answer about how we should all be working together better. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so some of the strategies I've heard today are getting close to the users um, and understanding what they need, um, differentiating um, policy so that it matches the needs of the people. So if it's ticket prices, you could have them higher for people getting new permits, lower for others. Um, making the argument bigger, like how does it help affordable housing, like finding out how it benefits more people. Um, a fourth one that I, I just read, uh, listened to the um, Street Fight a, a bit by the author Street Fight, who did really rapid, and this was like a really rapid changes in Manhattan to reclaim um, space for cars to make them into public spaces. And they did a lot of that through sort of prototyping. And I know Mark is an sort of expert in that. And the idea is like, if you can help allow people to start using it, then it doesn't seem so scary anymore. And furthermore, they love it. And then we can move forward like that. Is that could. Can we do more of that here? Brad Rawson says he's committed to sand barrels and putting them in the middle of the road. <laughs> the rapid prototyping thing is really interesting. Dan Bartman on the far right was a co-author of the Tactical Urbanism Manual that changed the world about 10 years ago or something. How long ago was it? Seven? I don't know. 
Um, so yeah, NeighborWays converts low stress streets into bike, head, dog walking, jogging corridors, and we use a lot of paint, and we're hoping to put planters in the, in the street this year, and, but I took my cue from some of the work that Dan did, so I'm gonna hand it over to him, because he's actually done some cool things in Davis Square as well. <laughs> I always get outed for working on that guidebook. Um, before, before we had any idea what it was going to be, um, I helped Mike Leiden from uh, Street Plans Collaborative from New York City um, to help produce those uh, series of booklets called Tactical Urbanism Volume 1 and 2. Um, we were really cataloging uh, small scale, unique, innovative uh, changes to the build environment that could lead to long term change, but, or, yeah, long -term change, but it had very little upfront cost. So one of the ways to, to prototype our streets is to literally just paint them differently. We're not talking about extending the curbs, planting new trees, putting in protected cycle tracks just yet. What we're talking about doing is testing it first and allowing it to work, allowing the culture to adjust to the change before putting out a big uh, RFP bid, bid style project that's gonna have a big contractor and a giant budget. Um, and what if it fails afterwards, right? So this was, all of these projects were different ways to test small incremental changes to the urban environment and see if they can improve our lives before we, before we uh, you know, spend big dollars on them. Um, and it really resonated with a lot of communities. It's, it, those documents have been um, translated into five languages now. Mike has a 300 page book uh, cataloging all of their work across the country. It's something that we immediately started integrating here about, uh, this includes all kinds of things, including parklets. Um, turning a parking spot into public space. About three months after I started with the city, the independent approached us wanting to build uh, an outdoor patio space uh, using its parking. Um, so this was almost something that I immediately started working on, had no anticipation that, that working on those guidebooks was gonna be useful in my daily job uh, with the city, but it's never left actually. We've, um, we've done pop-up plazas all over the place. Uh, we've tested um, bike lanes, for instance, um, on Marshall Street, uh, leading from Gilman Square to Broadway. Um, and we made that actually with paint that would wear off after a couple rains, uh, so we could test what a counterflow bike lane would be like uh, and to see if it worked. And if it didn't, uh, you know, all it took was a couple storms and it, the street would go back to what it was. So there, there are ways of, of experimenting in our, in our public realm to see if we can make improvements um, beforehand. That's what tactical urbanism is all about. Okay, so I think we're going to um, wrap up here because our time is up. But uh, to leave on a positive note, what I take away from this is that I hope we've been working and chipping away at incremental changes and I hope we'll enter a phase of rapid change and really revolutionary, but it will take sticking together as a community, listening, testing, experimenting, and then making, making sure that everybody benefits and then we get to the other side, you know, just like you think about how in gay marriage there was like a majority opposed it and then within a, such a short period of time, turned out it was it was great, and a lot of people now majority support it. So could we have a same kind of revolution that's peaceful in, in this as well? And I appreciate everybody being here. So I'd like to uh, thank the panelists for their insight and their energy and all the work that they've been doing. Stephanie, fantastic job moderating. To thank Stephanie Hirsch. And, we have an hour-ish or so for people to still mill around, talk to advocacy organizations, have conversations, carry on the conversations we're having here, buy a beer, and um, have fun and, and celebrate Bike Month. Again, Bay State Bike Month, uh, BayStateBikeWeek.org for all the activities that are really starting as of today, all month long in all of your communities. So uh, enjoy Bike Month and hopefully the warmer weather comes soon. Yeah. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.